everyone and welcome to a very very exciting edition of words images and worlds i think this is actually going to be episode 100 i think uh hard to believe that i've done 100 of these already but delighted to be joined by kazu kibuishi kazu thank you so much for taking some time out of your very busy life and busy schedule uh and talking with me for the for the episode yeah, no, no problem. Uh, I'm I'm happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely, my pleasure. I I generally ask about paths to authoring as a way of starting and what comics okay. allow you to do as an author. As we were saying just before I started recording, you do have an educator centered story about your creative life. So, would you like to share that at the top of the episode? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I do what I do today because of my English teacher in high school, uh, Miss Blake, Mrs. Doris Blake. She, uh, was teaching at Woodbridge high school, uh, in Irvine, California. And she told me that I could be a writer. And, uh, I was at a young age and she was very sincere, very serious about it. And, uh, it almost scared me like the way she told it to me, she, she, um, uh, the, the way this happened was this, I was not, I wouldn't, you would never have thought that I'd be a writer because I was the cartoon guy in school. Everybody knew me as the one who you called on to draw a big, silly mascot thing for the banners, or, you know, I just drew a lot of silly cartoons, making people laugh. Um, mostly funny cartoons, not, not even serious stuff. So, um, and I had long hair down to like my shoulders and wore my grandpa's, um, Hawaiian shirts, old Hawaiian shirts. And I would go to punk rock and ska shows and I'd surf and skate and, you know, just generally was just like a nice kid, but was a straight B minus student, nothing exceptional except that fact that he draws cartoons really well. And so um, I wrote a an essay um, based on the work of John Steinbeck. Uh, we read Cannery Row, my favorite book, and I um, I turned in this essay about writing about um, going to the beach and surfing, and I, and I described the the location and what it was like to do all that. And afterwards, I, I get an A plus 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 like uh, written on there with a little note that said, "See me after class." And so I, I talked to Miss Blake afterwards, and she, uh, she, she just very seriously said, "You could do this." And I and I asked her, "What what do you mean? What does that mean?" And she said, "You could do this for a living." And uh, I took it really seriously at that point, and I started writing my first books and short stories and screenplays, and that's uh, and I and I basically tried to quit art. I actually stopped drawing to focus wow. on writing. Yeah, and for three the next three years through through college uh, through high school, I focused on writing, and therefore I I I abandoned any dream of going to an art school for college, and I went to school for film studies as a screenwriter, more of a film historian, you know, just somebody who's studying the the history of movies and uh, wanting to learn how to write and direct my own films. Oh well, so a testament to the power of a teacher's words that just the right yeah. moment and just the right feedback yeah absolutely yeah um I, I probably would have just focused on drawing superhero comics or something yeah. um had she, had she not said anything it would have been my friends who i was drawing comics with that probably would have encouraged me to draw um at uh, at one of the major comic book publishers yeah. so that, that's a nice kind of lead in to my next question which is what is it about comics and graphic novels that allows you to do the work you want to do as a storyteller? And you mentioned film. I always think about yeah. like comics in the cinematic way too. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's, what's a good way to, well, I mean, really, I just, I've just been working in this medium since I was five. So I, I'm just really comfortable in it and, and it wasn't something I was trying to do so much as it was just what I do. And I had to accept that. It was one of the hardest things about choosing this career was settling down and saying, look, stop having ambitions for the outcome. Because at the time I thought I was, 
if I did if I drew cartoons, the best I could do is do a superhero comic that is probably not going to be well read, <laughs> and, and that that my 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 family wouldn't even understand. You know, they would look at it and go, you know, why aren't you a doctor? <laughs> and and I I didn't want to disappoint everybody by by following what wasn't even my dream. I was only drawing because my friends liked it and stuff. So, um, so yeah, I, I, um, I envisioned being a filmmaker after I watched Miller's Crossing by uh, the Coen brothers. Actually, I wanted oh, yeah. to be like Joel and Ethan Coen. They're, you know, I think they're the, some of the greatest filmmakers who ever lived. Um, you know, I grew up, I grew up with, um, you know, James Cameron movies and Steven Spielberg and Tarantino and all these guys. And I, I loved everything that they were all doing. It was really inspiring to me as a, as a viewer, as a, as a, as somebody who exper experienced them. When I started making films though, live action films, I started directing films and people really liked them. I did not feel like it was my space. Like I didn't feel like I was comfortable in, in that world. Like I didn't, these are not the toys I was familiar with working with 60 millimeter cameras and editing bays and everything. And as much as I enjoyed doing it, I did feel like it was a little bit of an awkward fit for me. Whereas when I sat down to draw my cartoons, I felt completely in command. Like I, I knew I was one of the best, even when I was in high school. So I had to, come to terms with the fact that my younger self had already chosen my path, oh, yeah. you know? And so I, it, it, it humbled me in, in this way where now comics wasn't what I wanted to do, but it knew it was what I do best. So I just admitted to myself, this is it. I'm going to focus on it. And I will try to do all the other things that I dreamed of doing through this. If it means making a movie, then I will do it through comics and 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 I'll try to just channel all of that energy, all my dreams and hopes and everything, and through this particular medium, this medium that at the time was really looked down upon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It really and was. It was. It was really looked down upon. Um, there was like almost shame, you know, <laughs> associated mm -hmm. with the work, and and there was like nobody doing well, uh, and there was no such thing as a graphic novel, so. Mm -hmm. I would I would have to come into this medium and essentially reinvent it for our new audiences, and 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 I I knew that I would have to take up that challenge. Not only do I have to be the best, but I would have to pave the way for everyone else as well. So that I I, I did that, and I feel like it's been it's been working. So you know, absolutely, you have multiple books, an epic series, um, yeah. I mean, really groundbreaking material. And uh, I was I was also going to ask what it is about the fantastic that draws you in, because there's this fantasy sort of element to to a lot of your work. Um, I'm trying to imagine your yeah. books as a film now. No, no, no. I it's, mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's it's so. So when I, I, I look at the media, I, I, like I said before, I try to work with what I've got. I work with the limitations of my reality, which is that I'm a cartoonist. I'm not a filmmaker, but I, I am a cartoonist. And I looked very deeply at the the craft of comics and, and what comics are and what can they do best. And I came to the conclusion that one of the best things that comics can do is compress information at a very high level that you can take big, big, big thoughts and ideas and epic stories and all sorts of stuff. And you can distill it down to just a few images if you did it right. That meant that my job then was for as far as like efficiency goes, if I like I'm a sports guy, I love baseball and football. And I, I love I love it at basketball. I play all, all the time. I, I like numbers. I like statistics. I like efficiency. I like I like all of that data. And, and so I sort of looked at it as like, how do I, how do I bat, uh, how do I bat, like, like, you know, how do I get a batting average, you know, higher than the, uh, than, than others. And, and I felt like the way to do that would be to bring in as much information as possible uh -huh. into a space and, ha and, and simplify it to the point where they don't like readers are don't know they're reading complex information that I have done such a good job of of articulating and, and finding the, finding the, um, the essence of a complex idea 
and 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 processing in a way that almost anybody can understand. The the more I did that, then I knew that I was I, I was I was going to do well with it. So with Amulet, um, it was kind of an exercise in trying to create this idea in my mind out of college was I wanted to create the pocket epic. You know, mm-hmm. I wasn't necessarily, I'm not necessarily the kind of person that likes big movies. I'm not, I'm not go to Marvel movies and all these other things. I mean, James Cameron is an exception to me. I think it's just, it's special. There's something different about his work. It's very literary to me. And so, uh, you know, I, um, I, I, I tr- so I tried um, to, you know, I, I tried to make books feel the way that maybe the fifties and sixties Marvel comics did yeah. um, back in the day, they just felt bigger. I think that a lot of the Marvel Cinematic Universe that we see now is really a reflection of like maybe the gold, golden and silver age of comics, not so much the comics of today. Yeah. And so like a small comic book could feel like another world that you picked up. And, and that's a very powerful thing that comics can do that I didn't feel a lot of people were taking advantage of in terms of how to use the medium. And so I wanted to make sure that I took full advantage of that and and tried to make Amulet as big as I possibly could um, within the small f- space that I had I had to work with. It's a it's kind of a George Lucas question, but did you envision it as this multiple chapter work, or is that something that's grown and continues to grow? Well, I always wanted to do multiple chapter series um, in the vein of uh, Bone by Jeff Smith mm-hmm. and Not Nasuka, The Valley of the Wind. By Hayao Miyazaki, those two works were my touchstones, and I was trying to make something that could sit on the shelf with those two books and belong. Um, but um, as, but when I started Amulet, I, I honestly didn't have this plan to make this that book. I thought it was just going to be one small book that I tried out the the graphic novel format with. And, and I pitched it as that to Scholastic. And they asked me to split that 300 page book I pitched into two books. And they said, we'll do a two book deal. Um, you know, two books that are 128 pages long or something. And then I ended up delivering a 192 page book for the first part and a 224 page book for the second. And I just realized that there was a lot more story to tell than I thought, which is always the case. Anytime I do uh, any project like Daisy Cutter was just one drawing and it became a graphic novel because I just wanted to see what happened next, you know? And I feel like as a creator, if I'm, if I'm, if I feel like I want to know what happens next and so will the readers. So that's, that's a good sign. Um, if you take a small idea and make it bigger than you expect. So a- Amulet was always, the story is actually very similar to what I always anticipated. I even told my assistant, like what would happen at the end of the series while we were working on Amulet too. Mm-hmm. And, and he was kind of surprised that we would go- take such a trajectory such as, uh, you know, it's such as I I did because I, you know, I told them at the beginning, I go, hey, listen, at, by the end of this, it'll be like Gundam. <laughs> There's going to be giant robots in space. Oh. And uh, and uh, here we are. So we have that. Here now. We are. Yeah. Um, and it's it's been great to I'm sure it's great for young readers to grow along with. I started teaching at about the same time I started teaching in 2007. So just a few years uh, mm-hmm. before Amulet really entered the world. And um, that's another thing that I love about it is the flexibility. Young people can it, it kind of marketed, I guess, in a lot of ways toward young people with yeah. Scholastic. But the flexibility of the audience, like a film, like a James Cameron film, I mean, yeah. a lot of different people, uh, different walks of life can enjoy the story and the joy. Yeah, parts of it. yeah. Uh, I, um, I, I didn't draw comics for kids until I did this. Even Copper, I think my, my web comic wasn't really for kids at the time. I mean, it was some pretty dark material. Um, and so I um it was a challenge for me, you know, to to try to, you know, to to fulfill, you know, my 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 dream of making things that were for grown-ups, but at the same time, because I was a young, young man, I wasn't like a parent yet. You mm-hmm. know, I didn't have any ambitions to write for kids as like I do now. Now I am a dad and I, I I see all my audience members. So I want to serve that audience now. Um, but when I was young starting this, I it was not, it was really, really hard to get myself into the mindset of an older me. Um, I think it's what took me longer. Uh, it took me a long, it took me longer to like warm up to any one of those books. Whereas now I could probably just 
start working on amulet book i know exactly what i should probably do and who's going to read it um but um but i think because i did that i think it is playing well for all ages like truly all ages you know when i hear all ages i think most people when they hear all ages they think it's just for little kids mm-hmm. and I, I when i hear that i hear all ages i hear all that's like i have to get grandma too you know absolutely <laughs> like, yeah because uh, I, I wanted to write it for my grandma too actually i wanted her to understand it too she didn't read much english so that's another thing that i think you know came up like it came up um while i was making the books since i was trying to to write for people who don't who may not even read english um it's now used quite often i think uh to teach people how to read english yeah, yeah as an educator absolutely I usually I notice that among the first students that gravitate toward the graphic novels in my classroom are students that are working toward English proficiency. Mm-hmm. It's a comfortable space. And it, it, again, the flexibility is just so interesting because you can also have really advanced readers that dig in and get a lot out of them, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that's what t- that's what takes so so long is like getting the layers in. Um, all that, like what, what you're seeing, the result of that, 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 that is intentional. It's one of the reasons why I end up drafting a scene, something like 30 times, because I'm, I am actually looking at it from so many different angles, not, you know, from like somebody at, at this age, like at a young age, will see this and somebody at an older age will see that aspect of it. And then, you know, somebody who doesn't like my work will see that, <laughs> see something like that, that surprises them. Because I, I I love like it when when I when I go to see something that I don't think I'm gonna like, and and the storyteller turns it on its head and and surprises me, and, and you know I think some someone like Tarantino is a perfect example of that where you just think how can that possibly work, how can I like a movie like this, I love this movie this is this is wild. <laughs> I could have never have imagined someone doing this and he did a backflip with it and landed it perfectly. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. So I always like to 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 look at it as a very nuanced and very complex uh, experience um, so that you know, no matter what type of person is walking through the door, they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna walk back out happy and wanting to come back. Absolutely. And, and Tarantino totally is like that. It's like, got to see the next one even though do i really yeah, want to i did you don't even yeah no, that's like how all of us we're just like what what is he doing and then you watch it and you're like oh man <laughs> i can't believe that worked yeah so totally. yeah I, I i do like that yeah playing playing with genres and things like that if you know your genres and know expectations really well you can both subvert them and also you know you can you can embolden your story with that knowledge so you, you should you, it, like it, I love that aspect of it, the, the the strategy of it. It's it's like the sports part of my brain loves that stuff. You know, it's the gamesmanship between you and the viewer and the the, re, the, the person experiencing your work. Um, like how how do you get it to the point where you, you're both having a lot of fun? And it's almost like you're saying to your reader, "Hey, you thought it was going to go this way, yeah. but <laughs> here's something else." Um. So last last official question, and then we can talk uh-huh. about anything else because I promised you a, a short podcast, and I know you have plans. <laughs> <It's> um, okay. <laughs> uh, landmark bombshell news of Amulet Nine landed just a few days ago when I initially reached out and I was going to interview you. Of course, I knew that Amulet Nine has been in development. But I didn't realize I was going to be talking to you just a maybe what has it been like a week or two since it was, was announced? It? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Um, yeah, that was not that was not part of the plan. But <laughs> so obviously not going to ask spoilers and all of those sort of things. Um, I don't even do that when a book's been released. But anything about the process that you would want to tell people about, and it's also just the opportunity in case you did not know that Amulet Nine was coming. Uh, in early 2024 that it that yes. is on the way february 6th um yeah um i guess the thing to that um you know to to take away that you know i i'm going to talk about a lot when the book's out is that you know i i i chose to take time on it and it, you know i i didn't i wasn't sitting there playing video games 
<laughs> I, I saw somebody say, what is George R. R. Martin Kazuki Bushi doing anyways? Are they just playing video games? Well, George R. R. Martin was probably making video games. <laughs> uh, and and I, I was I was I was actually working on Amulet and you know and, and it hasn't been that long between my books. Not not like George's books, but um but I um I did want to see if I had created something perennial. You know, I wanted to make sure that I, I was I, I was I was going to end the series not on a on like on a lower note than the previous notes because I, I think that this the um the the stress of of having to deliver on major promises and all the titanic um business decisions that are going around a book that's expected to sell very well I knew that everybody was going to have these expectations for this book um and so I I just didn't want to I don't know do what I think what ends up happening with a lot of books is that, uh, or series is that the pressure go, gets too big, you know, and, uh, you know, the creators end up relenting to the pressure and then end up giving you a book that is usually not the favorite book in the series. And so I wanted to make sure that I, I was, I was trying to go out strong, um, so that you, everyone will want to go back to read the first book. Um, and and during that time, I wanted to see if if Amulet has had a lasting impact. You know, th did it require me to do a book every year to keep it alive? And the answer is no, I didn't. I, I it, it has it's been doing better now than ever, um, and it's been a long time since the last book came out. So just from as a creator to creator standpoint, I can tell somebody now who does what I do, you don't have to always be rushing to get your work done. You can take your time and you may do better. In fact, I think you will do better <laughs> if you take your time. And the more people take their time to think about things, the more the people who read it will take their time to think about things. And so they will, you know, do as you do. And if you had patience and you're not going after money and you're not trying to like do the next cool thing without thinking about it, then you're probably helping as opposed to hurting um, society in general. <laughs> and so Amulet 9 was, you know, I, I mean, it was it was one opportunity where I could do this, where our, there was an anticipation. I can delay that, uh, that gratification um, of receiving this book. And during that process, I will be teaching patience and, and, and control. Um, and, and just knowing that that's important these days, cause not too many people do that. Uh, and I took a big, it's a, it's a big sacrifice on my part, honestly. And, and, and unfortunately for Scholastic, I think they felt that too, cause you're not, you're not going to get those sales and you're not going to, you know, it's not riding any kind of wave of hype, you know, but I, I believe that the audience would n not disappear. I, I knew that they would come back and I had, I had faith that they would be there. And, um, and I think that's going to be the case. So, uh, you know, for other comic creators or graphic novelists out there listening to this, and if they think of me as somebody to look up to, or as a leader in this industry, I'd like to tell them you could slow down and think it through and make less books that are better so that we have room on our shelves for all of us and all of you, you know, and all those stories, but not everybody has to have 50 books you know, on, on a person, on a one particular person's shelf. I feel that that would be like trying to create an obsession <laughs> right. and right. I don't, I don't know that that's healthy overall. You may make money, more money, but I mean, you probably do well enough with just a couple of books. In fact, actually, I think a lot about a time I met at the time I met Norton Juster, uh, who was the, the writer of the Phantom Tollbooth. Um, you know, I also met Jules Pfeiffer and had dinner with him. Um, and it was great. Two wise old men from our field, and, um, and when I sat down and talked to him, I sat down and talked to him about his, his actual day-to-day -day profession, which is architecture. Norton Juster is an architect and I, I would, I worked in architecture as well. So we talked about that and I, I think it's really great that he didn't feel the need to go into books as if it was a career. He wasn't trying to make money off books. He was just trying to write what he thought was interesting. And if he didn't have anything. Then he went back to doing what his job was, which was to build homes for people. And I think that was wow. his passion. It was a passion, you know? 
and and so that he didn't do it out of ambition and i think that's one of the reasons why you get a book that lasts that long because it was something like it, it's like your dad decided to tell this one story and that's all they needed you know to to get out there and and people shared it for a long time and that person goes on and just lives a regular life you know a successful one yeah. um, but it's just yeah, it's, yeah. so you know, I, I think about him a lot and um, I, I want to have, I want to be somewhere in between, you know, uh, like somebody who is a successful, um, very prolific author, but also one that, um, you know, uh, that you could curate, and, you know, over the years, even when I'm gone, I think, you know, I don't want to have somebody go, should I get Amulet 35 or, right, you know, right. between like with 35 and 40 or which ones should I keep on my shelf? Cause I don't have room here. <laughs> mm. Yeah. I'd, I'd rather it be more like, um, the Chronicles of Narnia or Lord yeah. of the Rings or Bone or Nausicaa. You can just, you know how big it is. You know, that's, that's not changing. You can put that on the shelf and know that it'll be there for you. And so I wanted Amulet to have that kind of uh, life. Uh, those, it's work to revisit. It's work to revisit. And that's part of the the beauty of writing and creating to begin with is not necessarily, I guess, the money or the the other things, but a reader creating something that can be enjoyed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I, I would highly recommend people not go this way <laughs> to try to make a living. Uh, it, it's like with sports too. I, I think, you know, you, you are an outlier if you succeed in these fields, you know, there, there are a lot of fields where you could just do well just by training up to, 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 to do that job. Uh, this is not one of them. And I, I see a lot of people trying to make it that. And I think that's only going to hurt the books. You know, um, I, I think it's better to just to, if you got something to say, then say it. That's great. If you, if you don't, you don't have to keep blabbering on <laughs> and you don't have to force everyone to listen to you, you know, um, you know, just dance when you feel like it and that's it. And then, and then walk away. And, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, that we see more of that over the years. I think the pandemic actually helped like pe slow people's, you know, pace of life a little bit, you know, and think about things. Definitely. Definitely. If there's anything good that comes from it, um, hopefully that's one of the things Yeah, that we yeah. can carry. Yeah. I hope there's a silver lining to ho hopefully to all that. There's a lot of bad stuff too. I don't know. <laughs> but we, don't get, we, don't, we, don't to, we don't have to get into all that. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely acknowledge that. But yeah, hopefully there's some, mm -hmm. some good lessons to be learned as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Looking forward to the journey ahead in Amulet 9 and whatever comes after. I know James Cameron, man, we waited. When was the last movie? Avatar 2000, was 2008, like, 2009. Yeah. Yeah. So 2009. Actually, it was actually, um, yeah, Avatar 1 came out um, when Amulet did. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Amulet 1, um, you know, was, uh, yeah, I, th I think it came out the same same week pretty much as Iron Man, the first the first Marvel MCU movie as well. Oh, wow. So, yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, so if people are giving me a hard time, and I've, I've done like nine, eight to nine books during all that time, <laughs> and James yeah. Cameron made just one more movie. Come on, yeah. I mean, I, it's totally worth it though. I, 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 I think you know, his he he should take his time. He's earned it. True, true, true. Yeah. true. Well, uh, as have you, and thank you so much for spending some time in the midst of everything else, talking with me on the show. And uh, as I said, looking forward to seeing what's ahead. All right, thank you. Thanks for having me on here, Jason. My pleasure. Thanks for saying yes. And All right. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much. Okay. Right.